Hello, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us virtually for this very important and timely discussion on addressing learning loss and inequity through the science of learning. My name is Courtney Lightfoot and I am the Managing Director of Alumni Engagement at the Yale School of Management. I am blown away by the interest in this event by Yale SOM alumni, as well as Yale College and other graduate and professional school alumni, um, and, and equally as blown away by the number of non-Yale participants joining us uh, for this event tonight. We are excited to get started and have a lot to discuss and unpack. So uh, just before we begin, I have a few very quick housekeeping uh, reminders. So this event will be recorded uh, and distributed to registrants uh, following the event. We will be taking questions today through the Q&A feature, so please add your questions there. Uh, should you have a question for a specific panelist, please be sure to note that in your submission. If you want to be sure your name is not mentioned at the time your question is presented to our moderator and panelists, please be sure to use the anonymous feature uh, when asking your question. Captions are going to be auto-generated in Zoom, so if you want to turn off this feature, you can do so by hiding live transcripts at the, or I'm sorry, by clicking on live transcripts at the bottom of your page and then selecting hide subtitle. So without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our moderator for tonight's discussion, Javier Arguello. He is a member of the Yale SOM class of 2003. Javier is an unlikely graduate from Yale because he is also a dropout from Montgomery College, a community college right outside of Washington, DC. And unlike so many, Javier was able to overcome this and other major setbacks early in his life and has since dedicated his career to increasing the likelihood of student success. Today, Javier is founder and executive director of COGX, a research and development firm specializing in applied cognitive science and developing programs for educators and students that improve learning outcomes. It is particularly meaningful to me to have this opportunity to introduce him as we have actually known one another ever since he was a student at Yale. And today I'm fortunate to rely on his leadership of the LSOM alumni community in Washington, DC. So thank you, Javier, and please welcome our moderator, Javier Arguello. Thank you, Courtney. It's great to, to be here. Uh, I always say that uh, in, in the field of education, I wish my celebrities were everyone else's celebrities. And what I mean by that is that the people that you'll hear from today, uh, I think should be known by everyone that's in education. Um, I would like to take a moment to, to introduce and recognize our panel, but I want to also be uh, terse without being curt. I cannot introduce them in detail without taking up the whole hour that we'll have together here. So I'm gonna be very brief and allow you to hear from their insights instead of having me do justice to their backgrounds. We will start with Professor Robert Bjork. He is at UCLA and he is, I think, one of the giants in the space of the science of learning that has coined many of the terms that we take for granted today, has been behind many of the seminal studies around human learning and has been a great inspiration for the work we do. We're fortunate to have him with us. We're also gonna hear from uh, Professor Mary Helen Mordino Yang. She's a professor out of USC. I must uh, not forget that Professor Robert Bjork is the co-director of the Learning and Forgetting Lab. So uh, I accidentally forgot that. So uh, <laughs> that's not by design. Mary Helen Mordino Yang is also the director of CANDLE, the Center for Effective Neuroscience Development, Education and Learning. And I also am joined by Professor Steve Jordans. He's out of the University of Toronto, a renowned uh, academic that has earned enormous amount of degrees and recognition for his good work as a professor, his research and his innovative techniques to improve learning for his uh, students in Toronto. So Toronto, uh, Canada actually has the highest rate of adult graduation in the world. And I don't know if that can be attributed single-handedly to Steve, but he's contributed to the graduation rate of his country for sure. Professor David Daniel is out of James Madison University, has also won uh, many, many awards nationally and global recognition for his work pioneering on the science of learning and democratizing access to this. And I'm delighted to be joined by him. And then we have Richard and Ross. Richard is the uh, superintendent of Graded, the American School of Brazil, which is in its 100th anniversary or maybe 101 by now. 
and is a pioneer in the field of education. He's been a public school teacher in the state of Washington and has now led transformations that uh, few would need to uh, after schools are performing the way his is, but maybe that's why they continue to innovate and lead. You'll hear from his experience. And last but certainly not least, uh, Ross Lescano Lipstein joins us. He's with Transcend, and he's the bridge that connects the science to the actual reality of making things happen properly. I don't know Ross as well as I know the rest, but I'm delighted that he is joining us. His degrees are enough to lift a village. He has an undergraduate from Harvard and a graduate degree from Harvard and another graduate degree from Stanford and is also a Broad alum uh, graduate. So I think with all of that, he could probably lift a few countries out of uh, <laughs> poverty. The good thing is he's dedicated to actually doing that, to helping people thrive and helping school systems modernize themselves. So I'm delighted to have everyone here. I will um, share very few slides to walk us through um, this presentation and have everyone join us. The first thing I'd like to do is maybe start by having us unpack the science of learning. Let's pull from some insights that are from Professor Robert Bjork that joins us today. So learning is actually a scientific process that is um, not something we do innately in a way that is productive or efficiently. It's something that actually needs to be taught regardless of my cognitive profile. When we rely on intuition to learn, we usually learn, uh, we apply techniques that are not the most efficient. In fact, they, they score very low in terms of the efficacy. So uh, these are insights from research that Robert Bjork has conducted over the years. So if I may start by asking you, Professor Bjork, tell us what learning success looks like. You're on mute. Now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I mean, a, a basic problem in terms of learning success and defining it is that a learner can respond to immediate uh, sense of familiarity, immediate ability to recall something, reproduce it. And those things are very misleading as to whether learning has been achieved, learning of the type that will lead to memory later and transfer of what's been learned to the situations where it's relevant. And very, very broadly, students can kind of fall into a trap thinking that they work like some sort of recording apparatus, that if they conscientiously take notes or or pay attention that the information will kind of write itself on them. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. That is, learning happens when new information and concepts are linked up with what you already know. And it's an interpretation kind of process that creates learning. And so to the extent that students don't have that kind of background, uh, and think that something like highlighting, repeatedly rereading text will create learning, uh, they're engaging in processes that are extraordinarily inefficient versus um, generating information, thinking how it applies, even the various natural kind of activities that students can do interacting with each other when they study together will often exercise uh, very effective processes. But it's very easy to be fooled basically as to whether the learning has been achieved that will support your later retention on an exam or in a real world context where <clears throat> information and procedures are relevant. Can we bring this to life with them? Perhaps a ridiculous example that may be true. <laughs> Let's say we have a valedictorian that never studied the science of learning. How did they get straight A's throughout their whole life? Could they have possibly been performing academically without necessarily having been learning? Could you explain the difference perhaps between learning in a way that's durable, deep, and fosters transfer and maybe explain why that's important? Yes, I mean, one, one reason that can happen is that uh, their competition, so to speak, if you want to think of it that way, other students <clears throat> are also probably not um, studying and learning in an actual optimal kind of way. And 
teachers can be misled strongly. There's um, now some very important work in England in mathematics instruction in middle school uh, by a research by a teacher named William Enemy. I said Enemy, but it's Emony, uh, mm -hmm. who actually got an award in Parliament for this work, and a lot of it is. Uh, his own personal story is interesting when he found out that these students performing so well on the quizzes, whatever he had, were not on the end of the year exam that really mattered and determined to a large degree what your educational future was going to be. He, he couldn't really believe that these students who had seemed so well prepared were then performing poorly. And he drew on the body of cognitive science research in a very innovative way and has changed quite dramatically uh, the long-term and really long-term performance, uh, the, the learning level of his students. And so uh, there's a lot of reasons to use ineffective things. Uh, highlighting may make you feel like uh, uh, you're not falling asleep, you're doing something act active. Uh, rereading uh, is important, but rereading right away is a useless use of time. Whereas rereading a chapter again after a week is quite productive. So students don't tend to understand the power of spacing repeated study opportunities, uh, which can on long-term tests can increase performance by a factor of two often. For those that don't know, the spacing is one of uh, four key retrieval strategies that have a lot of uh, research on their efficacy. And um, this, this is important because a lot of students will cram and do well. And this doesn't say that cramming does not allow you to do well. The real question here is for how long do you want to learn? Do you want to learn for a day or do you want to remember and convert the information into usable knowledge for the future? Which gets into the important point of transfer, right? So would you say that um, spacing contributes to deeper learning, which uh, allows you to amass knowledge in a way that can create a more critical thinker and a more creative thinker? Or would you say that that's a stretch? I think across the entire history of research on human learning and cognition, it's hard actually to find a single empirical effect that's larger and more consistent than what's called the spacing effect. It actually traces back 115 years to the origins of experimental research on how people learn. But, it, but students can get into a pattern of massing or blocking or cramming uh, for a number of reasons. One is just poor time management, like uh, I myself was guilty of during my entire undergraduate career, where there's no choice but to cram towards the end, often all night before a morning exam. And what can be really misleading is cramming can actually create quite good performance uh, on a very short term. Uh, I probably saved my grade point average by that cramming. Right. But then after that, forgetting is extraordinarily rapid. So if what you're learning is important for future learning, it's a terrible idea to, to cram. And, and activities like spacing and retrieval practice are just crucial for long-term memory. Right, so fair to say that the prevalence of cramming might help explain the scarcity of STEM degrees, right? because we're, we're studying over, we're building a, a very fragile foundation of understanding to at best perform the next day, but we're pre preventing ourselves from succeeding going forward. And that's yes. why prior knowledge is such a strong predictor of future knowledge. So yes, if, this, if, can, a given, if a given course is a prerequis prerequisite for the next course or two, right. uh, you are prepared very poorly by having crammed. Correct. Whereas, uh, spaced, uh, will support performance and support all new learning builds on old learning. And so uh, it's very important and any prior prerequisite experience will create the foundation for the new learning. Right, thank you. I, uh, I will transition over to Professor Mary Helen Imordino and I will promise to make this fluid. If I ask a question that inspires any of you to answer, please do go ahead and jump in. 
I'm trying to allow a bit of structure so that we can uh, follow. I failed to explain this at the beginning. We're going to discuss insights first as we're doing now. Then we're going to discuss the importance of translating this to applying it with fidelity in the classroom. And then we're going to move on to transformation, right? So moving on to emotions and, and learning, we'll get back to this in a second. I often hear Professor Mordino Yang say that learning is actually emotional. I'll stop. What do you mean? <laughs> All right, let me just uh, let me just start by saying, you know, what I mean is that what you're having emotion about, you're thinking about, right? And what you're thinking about, you have the possibility of learning about, depending on how you then proceed, right? As we just heard from Professor Bork. So what this means is that this, the, the entry into learning comes from a need to know. It comes from a student's curiosity, from their sort of attempting to pull into their worldview, the story they're telling themselves about how things work, information that's gonna help them to understand and predict the world around them. So I, I want you to just think for a second, Javier, about yourself as a dropout of Montgomery College or whatever happened in the story right there. And I want you to think for a second about is the reason you dropped out of college, and I don't mean you, I mean you and kids like you, is the reason that you didn't do well the first time around because you didn't have effective study strategies for remembering information that somebody else gave you? Maybe. But if somebody had given those to you, would that have fixed the problem? Probably not. Why not? Because learning doesn't start with semantic information that somebody else curated for you, right? That's where we start when we get to school. But real learning is about the dispositions of mind. I mean, the kind of learning that contributes to the development of a person, that contributes to who you are, what you're capable of, how you position yourself in the world, your sense of purpose, the way that you then construct narratives about the world as it is, the world as it could be, the world as it has been, right? The historical context you're in, right? And then position yourself in that narrative in a way that you then leverage the skills and the knowledge that you are acquiring for something useful in the world, right? That kind of deep motivation, long-term purpose, intellectual virtue that we really strive for in our citizens. So what I'd like to give is kind of the complementary side of this conversation, which is that children are people, right? Children, teenagers, adult learners, all of them are people first. They need to have a reason to know the stuff that you're giving them. And that reason, if it's only in order to pass this test next week, right? So that you can go on more if in the system, that's a very thin reason for a lot of people. That's a very unmotivating reason. And for the people for whom that is a deeply motivating reason, I worry also, because then when you get where you're going, what do you do with it, right? How many kids do we have who have gone all the way through, I don't know, Yale University and get to the end and say, I don't know what I'm interested in. I don't know what my life is for. Why did I do all this, right? And so what I wanna really highlight for just an instant is what we're finding in the lab is that when young people, when we interview young people and young people like you might've been when you were 14, 15, 16 years old, right? And then we follow those kids over time with brain imaging, with uh, psychophysiological recording, recording how their bodies react when they're engaging in complex learning tasks and thinking about meaning they've made out of things they've witnessed in the world. And then we follow them into young adulthood. What we discover is that young people's, what we call dispositions of mind, irrespective of IQ, irrespective of their ethnic uh, background, irrespective of their parents' level of education, irrespective of the socioeconomic resources available to their family. When kids show us that they are curious about understanding things deeply, that they follow up on ideas and are willing to do what we call transcendent meaning making. So they take facts, they put them together, but then they think, well, well, why do I need to know that? Why does that matter? How do I feel about this? How does this help me understand something in the world that I may have witnessed or something that I do or could do in the world? When kids show us that their disposition is to engage in that way, the more they do that, we can predict that they're gonna grow their brains differently over the next two years when we bring them back to the lab again. 
the starting point is two years later within the same kid, we can predict the kind of network activity growth in all the networks that are involved in the most important kinds of learning. We can predict based on those dispositions of mind. And in turn, the degree to which they've grown their brain in those beneficial patterns for learning and for social interaction and for emotional well being and all these regulatory capacities and things, the degree to which they've done that statistically mediates. It explains how they feel as young adults, how happy they are with their lives, how successful they are in school or in work, if that's what they're doing, or parenting, if that's what they're doing, how much they feel like their current opportunities are what they always dreamed of for themselves, how coherent their identity is as compared to like endorsing statements like, I don't really know what I believe, sure. I just go along with the crowd, right? It's fair to say that, that learning is propelled by purpose, which is given through emotion, because we need to care to pursue, correct? Yeah, um, except I wouldn't use that? the word given through. I think it's conjured through. I think we want okay. to put the locus of activity back in the person. We sure. as teachers don't do things to people, what well, we do, but we shouldn't. That Those are not right. the things that really impact learning. What impacts learning is when you provide opportunities for people to engage meaningful, meaningfully with information and activities and, and other people's, you know, in discussion in ways that will set them up to be inclined towards striving for deeper meaning. And then when that happens, then all of the great study strategies that we just heard about can apply because now somebody's got a reason to learn, right? They're, sure. they're engaged in the process so, itself and invested in the information. These insights are deeply powerful, but uh, learning is very complex with variables outside of my own locus of control as a student. And then there are variables outside of your locus of control as my teacher. We have pollution from the real world, and there's a lot of pollution. And, and there's pollution. pollution. What do you mean by pollution? I'm curious. Emotional what pollution. What I mean is this adverse Stress. childhood experiences. We have uh, surveys that reveal that across the US, 61% of adults say they have experienced adverse childhood experiences. The, the lower the income or, or across some ethnicities, you have even higher adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. So if learning is emotional and emotions affect learning, what effect are we having on society when these negative pollutants are affecting so many students and, and at the expense of, of not being accused of solipsism for only showing US data, this is a global know, problem. It's all over the world. It's all it's over the world. So, there are studies that show that one in two kids suffer from violence. One third of 11 to 15 year olds are bullied and the emotional violence effect affects one in three kids, right? This affects students' uh, decisions, the impulsive behaviors, risky uh, mm -hmm. disease, so, death. So, so what I would say is that we're, GDP, we're, actually, so. yeah, we're actually studying this right now, trying to understand how it is that the mechanisms of the brain that are impacted by trauma, right? Basically, you can think of sort of the central network executive hub that kind of goes <gasps> when you make a mistake, right? Or when you're traumatized, right? That that is the same mechanism neuropsychologically in the brain that steers your learning. When you're thinking, doing a math problem and you're thinking through and you go, oh, whoops, nope, right? Or, oh, wait, I don't understand that word when you're reading, right? right? So if you're traumatized, we and others have actually shown that that region of your brain is thinner physically and less well connected to other regions. And if that's really extreme, then it's associated with PTSD, right? Correct. Um, so we've actually shown that kids in Los Angeles and low-income neighborhoods, right, have thinner cortex there that correlates with IQ, and it's in the same place in a PTSD meta-analysis, right, of soldiers deployed to war, right? And we've also found that across adolescents, we think of this as happening in little kids, just in the two-year window between the two, uh, the two times that we uh, scan the kids, the violence that they have even witnessed in that window impacts their brain substantially. Sure. In you know, ways that we can actually see structurally in the brain. So what I think we really need to understand much better as a field, because there just isn't the research yet to really connect this to educational learning, is how is it that shifting these mechanisms for, for example, error and performance monitoring, which is really that kind of like, whoops, wait, oh, wait, what's my math answer, right? Why is that wrong? Wait, that's surprising. Let me engage with that again so I can figure out what happened, right? That, um, that we need to understand how that is being impacted by uh, social experiences in the world for good and for bad, right? And then how that can be, how the information about how it's being impacted can, can lead to strategies for helping students to remediate 
and heal themselves, grow themselves in ways that are beneficial for learning and for social emotional well being at the same time. That these things we think of them as separate, but they're actually the learning mechanism that you know helps you to know where you are in a problem space or whether you understand a word that you just read is the same one that tells you you're about to get you know smacked if you're like an abused kid. It's the same mechanism. So right. we need to really get much more serious, I think, with the research and understanding how it is that social experience and learning are tied to one another. We don't have so, a good understanding of that yet. Correct. Thank you. This is a great insight. I, I think we're unpacking the complexity of learning. It's not just a cognitive process. It, there isn't just a proper way to learn that we don't teach explicitly and we should. There's also the complexity of emotions. Learning is an emotional process and the emotional experiences we have in the real world affect our ability to succeed. I will throw another curveball and I'll throw it to Steve Jordan's. Learning affects emotions, so this is different. Could it be that in my case or in someone else's case, I struggled to learn because my working memory was weak, which affected my executive function, which then affected my emotional well-being and my overall ability to learn effectively. So could the first domino be a cognitive one that affects my emotions? And if so, now you, you inherit me as your student. I'm a freshman at the University of Toronto. You have this broken learner. Uh, we're all broken learners. What do you do to support my success in your class? Can cognition be targeted? Can you improve my ability to learn? And is that even your role? You're a professor. Yeah, uh, well, you know, from, from my perspective, absolutely, we can have this kind of domino effect and absolutely emotion is critical to learning. To a lot of students, they almost see it as a competitive endeavor where they are there competing with their fellow students. And so, yeah, if for some reason, be it working memory capacity or, or whatnot, they start to feel like they're not keeping up, um, then that's going to put them into this sort of mindset of anxiety and such, which is just going to get in the way of the learning for sure. Uh, so we need to do what we can, as I was saying in the chat, to try to make that place feel as safe as possible. And we need to work in what Vygotsky would call that zone of proximal development, trying to convince students that it's not about being the best student in the class, it's about personal improvement, you know, personal best. Like we do, you want to get to the Olympics? Don't worry about the other athletes. Worry about yourself. Worry about trying to get continually better. And the rest, the, the competition will take care of itself. So, you know, very much trying to encourage students to embrace the learning and to be able to kind of document every now and then, hey, look, you, you did this activity. Your original draft wasn't very good, but after you went through a learning process, you produced something a lot better. You know, look at that. Uh, that's evidence that you're doing well and this is a good process for you. So I think we do need to provide that emotional support. It's hard as a teacher. We have to do so many things. But I think one of the core things we want to do is to, to create this vibe where we, we really do embrace the growth of the students. I, I'm almost feeling like I'm going to get into the growth mindset stuff without getting into it. But where, you know, that's what's important to us, not what grade they get. Um, sure. It's about challenging themselves and doing better. So I, I have a, a theory about both you and David Daniel that to me, that's, it's no coincidence that the two of you are, are loved by your students, are highly regarded in your own countries for your excellence in teaching. And, and the fact is, I always say privately to you guys something that I'll say publicly, I, I think you guys cheat. You have a level of information about how students learn that most teachers don't have. And that benefits you. And you're also trained as a scientist to be able to test what works and to modify accordingly and generate evidence of my success learning in your class. Can you give us some concrete examples of how you actually develop cognitive skills? What cognitive skills do you develop? Just to give context here, your class is so popular at the University of Toronto that I think you have thousands of people enrolling. Technology had to be built. Uh, how do you keep my learning successful if I'm one of 2,000? What, what do you do? I know you run the Center for Advanced Technology and Learning. Can you give us some examples of how that happens? Sure. So, so let me go into my, my pet issue, which is the skills gap issue, where you know employers are asking for graduates that come that are able to solve problems and give oral presentations and collaborate well and communicate well. And when they get our graduate from university, they're sometimes disappointed and, and reflecting back to us, you know, we wish you guys could do that better. Uh, and I personally think these skills 
be they critical thought, creative thought, communication, that they are at least as important for our students' eventual success, if not more important than the information they learn. So I want them to learn the skills, but unlike information, you only develop skills through repeated structured practice. So this is the cognitive science coming in where, where our skill system um, is very different from our information system. And so what I do with students is, first of all, share the cognitive science with them. You know, I, I share with them the fact that these skills are going to be critical to your success. I use funny stories like critical thinking will help you get a good job. It'll also help you pick a good life partner. And, and that's kind of important to, you, to your success in life. Uh, and so these are skills that will help you succeed. I expose them to the literature saying, you know, you need to practice and you need to practice in a, in a feedback rich environment. And then, yeah, we've created a technology that specifically allows them to get that practice by doing things like peer assessing each other's work, but on mass, like you, you give feedback to six students and we really structure the process, scaffold it, if you will, with micro learning resources to kind of help the student really understand what we're asking them to do. Um, and then they do it to the first peers work, second, third, fourth, fifth. So they get that repeated practice. Uh, and then eventually they move to a step where they're practicing learning from the feedback they received, literally that sort of growth process. Can you take constructive feedback and get past the fight or flight reflex? Because when people criticize us, we don't want to listen to them. Uh, we have to teach students that this is the natural reaction and how to get around that. Um, and then we put them through that experience. So, so the short answer is, you know, A, give them a really rich experience that's science-based but B, perhaps as important, explain all this to them ahead of time, get their buy-in through understanding. And when they're buying in with you, then everything gets easy. And, and, and what by the buy-in, by the way, you're also communicating to them, I'm not making you do this just for no reason. Um, I, I care about your success. And this is the path I'm taking to try to help you reach that success. And when they see that caring mixed with the intelligent reaction to how to do that, they tend to buy in and things go really smoothly. So if I tie this back to the beginning with what yep. Robert Bjork was, was saying from some of the scientific principles of, of learning, you're talking about the importance of me being aware of my learning pra uh, process. So that means you're yep. raising my metacognition, my ability to monitor and control my own learning. You're fostering right. deliberate practice, which is my ability to then uh, analyze what I may be doing wrong in order to improve it. And that raises critical thinking. You're improving my ability to learn by comparing my work to that of my peers. That fosters collaboration and critical thinking. And you talked about the exactly. zone of proximal develop development, which brings us back to the beginning where Professor Bjork was, was saying that a lot of effective learning doesn't really feel effective. It's a productive struggle. Yes. He coined the term yeah. dif desirable difficulties. So there's a lot of jargon that, that is used, but it's very useful in packing some of the principles that are really important for human uh, learning. So I, I wanna switch uh, over to allow time for all of us to kind of bring this together as a group, switch over to Professor David Daniel. Um, let me see here, uh, traditional teaching, uh, what research says is that it is often kind of disconnected from how students learn. I would love to blame my teachers for my failures learning. I, I was a trifecta, a disaster on probably my behaviors, my emotions, and I don't know what my cognitive profile was like, but it was probably not but where it needed to be to perform where I needed to perform. So um, I can't blame teachers. I, I can only learn to learn for myself to succeed as others did, right? So whatever it is that, that you're doing, Professor Daniel, is yielding great results from the output that comes through um, the accolades you get from your students and their success. But you've argued that it's really important for learning scientists to design their principles for use in the classroom and test them, right? Using the outcome measures important to teachers before recommending these to educators. So you are an educator first. And in this case, again, I think you're a privileged educator because you know more than most educators do. But what sort of evidence do you think is good evidence for a teacher to rely upon in order to guide their practice teaching? Oh, well, thanks for the question. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to switch that a little bit as I think about the question. Um, there's two kinds of evidence. There's evidence that inspires you to do something in your classroom. There's evidence that it was effective. Um, an idea to do something in, in your classroom can come from walking on the beach. It can come from, from any place. So first off, um, in terms of evidence in your classroom, you should be generating evidence that what you're doing is working. Wherever the idea came from, 
it's our responsibility to actually um, demonstrate to ourselves that this is actually effective practice, just like we're asking our students to demonstrate effective learning through our assessments that we do. Um, if you're turning to the, to the literature, the scientific literature, um, you have to look at, uh, first off, was this, the, is this data actually applicable to your context, right? Um, so my other hat, my researcher hat, um, I want to have a lot of internal validity. I want to make sure I can try to get down to cause and effect. I want to leave out variables as much as possible so can isolate the key ones. I don't have that opportunity to do that in the classroom. It's a very, very messy place. I need to have research that actually it airs toward external validity. Um, and sometimes we don't see that because that's not what the scientist was trying to do. That's not what they were supposed to do. Um, but we grab onto it anyway, and we take it from a simple context to a more complex context with multiple interacting variables and get actually subvert learning in, in the long run. So the kind of information that a teacher needs is some indication that it's promising for their context and their students and a problem that they have or a, a solution they're trying to reach in their classroom. If it looks promising, um, does the research suggest how that would be designed for a teacher to activate the student? Right, as Mary Helen said, the students are doing the learning. We're just providing the context and the tools and the scaffolds to, to encourage that to happen, but they have to do it. Um, has, does, is there anything in this article or in this research literature that shows me how this might be deployed? Um, otherwise, the responsibility goes straight onto the educator. We not only have to know the science and its nuances and the theory um, and the findings, we have to figure out how to design it for use in our classroom. That's a large, ask of a teacher, just like it's a large ask of a scientist to design for a classroom that they're not part of. Um, so the kind of evidence that we want is, is evidence of promise. And then we have to take it the rest of the way on our own. Fair to say that um, there, there's an important piece of trying to validate the evidence and customize the insights in order to make sure they work for your specific audience as an educator. So it's hard or impossible to replicate outcomes that are proven in a lab and to always replicate them with success in a classroom. And, and that's not just true for output coming out of research on how humans learn, it's true for all kinds of scientific research. So a, a you know, purist would say, the ideal here is that we follow the scientific method as educators. So we know what to do with this nutritious insight, but we still are responsible for being the chefs that construct some uh, uh, dish to, to steal your metaphor. That, that would that be fair? And, and the second part of this question is, I'm not a trained scientist like you, and I am a teacher, right? In this hypothetical environment, you don't want me to be your teacher with my record, but let's assume I am. So I'm not gonna be a scientist like you, but I can still improve my teaching by understanding these principles. So these are not silver bullets, but they are bullish bullets that can be polished. And maybe bullets in schools are not, the best uh, metaphors to use because we have too many of those in, in the US. But you know what I mean, uh, nothing is as shiny as it looks, but there is potential to shine these things through deliberate effort on behalf of the teacher, correct? Does yeah, but, yeah, it, it makes sense. But, but <clears throat> first we have to um, agree that the scientific method is gonna yield the kind of proof that we find valid in the classroom. And, and um, educators aren't necessarily trained that that is the only or the best kind of proof. Um, as, being trained, you know, as, as a researcher, I do, right? Um, and I think all responsible teachers are scientists in their own way. If you define scientist as someone who uses a scientific method. Um, so if you're using a scientific method to demonstrate that your stuff has impact, then you are generating data. And, and a responsible teacher is a data generator. It's an evidence generator, not a recipient. So you were talking about the cook metaphor that I use. Um, basically, I argue that teachers are more than servers. They don't just take the stuff from the kitchen to the student. There's a lot of skill, a lot of things that a teacher has to, to learn and do, even if it's implicit, to be effective. They're much more like cooks who takes these ingredients and create something that's both palatable and nutritious. If we err one toward, away from um, palatable, they won't they won't engage in it. And if we make it so sweet and wonderful that all they do is want to eat it and it's not nutritious, it doesn't really do our job. So right. science of learning can give us lots of ingredients, but it has been mixed together in a way that is usable. That's kind of, it's like an apothecary, right? The science of learning is an apothecary for a teacher. Now there are certain principles, by the way, and um, Bob, for example, really was talking about time, effort, um, these sorts of things that 
are behind a lot of these sort of these things. So if you look at studying, for example, all your teachers out there, if you look at it as interval training, right? I can, I can work really hard for one day. I'm not going to get a whole lot of gains. I can cramp, right? I could work constantly with low effort all day with one pound weights. I'm not getting a lot of gains. But interval training, where I work hard, I rest, let the muscles rebuild or, or let myself re rebuild, however long you rest, right? I rest, go back and do it again better right? That's got spacing built into it. That's got retrieval built into it. It's a natural way to do things. It's just not a natural way we do these things. Schooling's an artificial sort of thing for the human organism. We weren't made to be in school. So the strategies that we have, have evolved over time to be default aren't necessarily the most productive ones, just as Bob said. So these things do have to be cultivated and, and learned. And the last thing I want to say about this is we're, do, whatever, what, the, we're not doing learning. We're guiding development. My background is lifespan developmental psychology. And education is really culture's effort to guide development a certain way. And so when we're talking about the emotions and we're talking about engagement and we're talking about cognition, we're talking about the brain, we're guiding the development of those things. Um, and that's an important responsibility. And I think using a method of, um, to generate proof that what we're doing is being effective for the goals we have is an important thing. Great. So David and Steve, if I'm not mistaken, you both teach mostly freshmen at a college level. Um, obviously, that's the population you choose to work with. David at James Madison, Steve at University of Toronto. Um, what percentage of the students that matriculate at UT as freshmen were explicitly taught how to learn effectively, would you say? That's kind of a trick question. I can do a follow up. Yeah, no, no, I mean, unless they take an educational psychology course, which some of them do, um, so I offer such a course, and so those students, but that's a small, you know, we're, we're talking hundreds when there's thousands a year um, going through. I, I think that would be act actually a fantastic idea to make them really good consumers of what is good educational practice, what is good study practice, um, and I would love to see students going into a classroom and saying, what, all multiple choice exams here? That's not going to help me for my future, is it? Uh, it's a bit of a dream, but uh, but that's what I would love to see. Yeah. So if they do, if they do know this, it's because of a course they took in college. I guess I didn't, I, I didn't ask very explicitly. From 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 how they were taught in K through 12, do you find yeah. that a significant percent are ever taught to learn effectively? Is there a science of learning course that is common for students to take as they go through school that makes them more likely to succeed when they get to college? I, I do not know of one in Canada. I'll, I'll let David speak um, to, to the U.S. Um, no, there's efforts right now. There's grants. But um, I just want to kind of go with what, something you said. They are effective learners in high school because they get out of high school. They're, they're actually doing what, what they're asked to do. Are they independent learners who can then deploy those skills across contexts? No. They, but they're, they're, a lot of them are really good at doing what they're supposed to do. And although they, and some of them do get formal training, and it's the kind of training we don't want them to have. They're told sure. by their teachers, reread. They're told by their teachers, the highlight. They're told by their teachers to do everything their teachers did when they were in school. Correct. Um, and there's, a, there's several studies that have shown that the advice they're getting from their teachers is the stuff that for, in the Donlosky article, the, the review article, for example, those are things that don't work. Sure. Yeah. Right. So uh, they, they help them get to the point where they're getting what they need to do, doing what they need to do to do what they want them to do. But they're not becoming good learners. Um, Mark McDaniel has a really nice course on this in, in high school. He's been working on. He's publishing on. Great. If I may just jump on that really quickly, just to say too, it's it's not just the teachers. Sometimes it's systemic. You know, what do we do? We talk about the beauties of a growth mindset, but we give students a due date and we say it's got to be done then, and they do it. A hour before they submit it and it's over. Where is their opportunity to grow from feedback and improve their work? If, if we just give them one shot to submit everything, we're building a habit that is actually disadvantageous to their eventual sure. growth. And, yeah, and, and I, think, pursuing... I think Bob, sorry, I think sure. Bob would, would agree that we, we, always, we always tend to err toward efficiency in terms of time and effort, right? And those, some, those are counter indicative of good learning sometimes desirable difficulties, those sorts of things that Bob talks about, um, and they, they talk about the science of learning, are actually require more effort, more time, less of a flash judgment of familiarity, and more of a time to develop deep knowing and to provide the feedback to let you know when that's happening. So this, this 
this heuristic, we, we deploy these heuristics and heuristics work in, in certain contexts That's how they're there, but not in the one we're asking them to perform in if we want higher levels of, of learning. I hope the audience is as nerdy as I am and excited in what you guys are saying because these in insights are profound for the way we currently teach and things we could do to modernize and improve upon with uh, the learning of students, right? This is really important. So in, in David's explanation here, that what I take is I may succeed at performing academically in the system as it exists, but that does not by any stretch mean that I'm being taught to learn independently, which is what I need to do when I go to college and for the rest of my life. Even worse, I may be depending on skills that are proven to be ineffective for that to happen. So in this case, the recipe is counter the objectives. Uh, and, and with that, I think we can get into a, an, a very obvious question, but uh, Mary Helen or, or Bob, would you guys agree that uh, engagement is a prerequisite for learning and negative engagement or decreasing engagement, it correlates to uh, drops in learning. Is, is that, that clear cut and simple? Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can respond okay. first if you want. Uh, you know, it's this, one, one, there's a formula here that's just not working very well overall. First of all, if I do everything I know will enhance long-term memory test, retrieval practice, space, generation, all the things, the first thing that happens is I will lower my student ratings of my course. As students cool. expect to be taught the way they have been taught, uh, you are incorporating difficulties and so on. So it, it, what is kind of interesting is Universities and colleges worry about preparation in something like English usage or maybe algebra some places, but they, there isn't a concern for whether students are positioned to take on this, let's say at the college level, four or five years of an intense learning activity. That is, are they, do they know how to learn? Are they prepared to take that on? And uh, in general, uh, not. Yeah. So, so um, fair, I can also to add it. to that, um, uh, you know, a complimentary answer, which is that I, I really think um, it's, that's absolutely right, what we just heard. And I think we need to think about engagement in a different way. And I think the neuroscience is also helping us to see that, that the way I've been talking about this lately is that there really are kind of two kinds of engagement. Um, you know, if you look really big picture, one of them is engagement with a task focus where you're directly engaging with, you know, moving your pencil on the paper, completing the task, you know, kind of a dig in and work kind of thing, which is essential, right? And then there's another kind of engagement, which is often underprivileged and undervalued and not taught or supported in traditional schooling, which is kind of um, a disengagement from explicit task productivity in the most direct sense in order to engage with deeper assimilative you know, kind of integrative understanding building, questioning, curiosity building, thinking about what is this for? Where else does it apply? How does it relate to what I learned last week, right? Which is also kind of deep thinking that promotes memory, right? That's been known for decades that that kind of deep thinking promotes memory. Um, and, you know, we can even see in our lab that kids who, who are inclined to do this five years later, when we ask them, by the way, tell us about the stories we told you about other teenagers when you were at the lab five years ago, they remember more of them right? Um, and we can actually predict which one they remember based on how they did that and how their brains activated, and how their eyes sure. blinked and all kinds of things to show engagement. So I think what we really need to think about in education is shifting from engagement and emotion that pertains to outcomes, right? To shifting to engagement and emotion that pertains to big ideas, that pertains to the overall understanding of things. When kids are engaged in process-oriented learning, right? When, they're, um, when their engagement is with why and how things work as compared to whether or not I am done, whether or not I finished, I remembered, I passed the test, right? When we shift the conversation so that it's focused on process, we get much deeper learning. And that naturally kindles curiosities and dispositions for purpose and self-efficacy. And we've actually shown that schools that, significant, that, that do this, for example, Montessori schools versus traditional schools in Lausanne, Switzerland, right? Where everybody is doing really well on all the international metrics. And even comparing with the same math scores, we can see in the brains of kids who were Montessori schooled versus traditionally schooled that they react differently to errors and that the Montessori schooled kids 
react more slowly initially, like David said, right? This is not efficient early on. You need to take the time to figure out for yourself what happened, right? But then by adolescence, and these are not longitudinal data, these are cross-sectional data, but by ad adolescence, we see that kids who were Montessori schooled in really high quality Montessori schools where they were engaging with their own meaning making with each other, where their teacher was sort of funneling them or shit, you know, pushing them to materials she or he thought would be the right ones to help them understand something next, that when they did that, when they saw errors on math problems that they did in the scanner, they actually shifted into deep thinking, right? They, they actually, we see math areas and emotion areas sure. and reflection areas activate as compared to the other kids who shifted into hippocampus, right? They shifted to memory. They wanted to remember what the answer was rather than engage with the what you could learn from this, this feedback and this information. So in the spirit of applying another tip that I have read, that metaphors improve learning and to sustain a thread across what you guys are saying, uh, I understand what Robert said initially to mean that uh, if you're my professor and, and to keep this metaphor of, of nutritious ingredients and the chef, when you give me spinach, you improve my ability to learn, but then you get judged for your failure to give me chocolate, which is what I demand. And the system rewards the distribution of chocolate. So first we need to change the structures so that yes. we don't call uh, chocolate nutritious and we begin to love spinach. And what Mary Helen is saying is that not only is this possible, but the why behind your eating and the motivation and the process which Maria Montessori stumbled upon uh, by complete accident is critical. And these are principles of active learning, which we're you know, unpacking the science of learning as we go. Active learning is what Professor Wyman did at Stanford and reduced the dropout rate by about, or the failure rate by about 70%, applying some of the principles that we're discussing here, which is something that Steve Jordans was saying, which is the importance of collaboration, deliberate practice, reflection, metacognition. These are all principles that I think should just be mainstream conversations and not obscure nerdy talks that we have and think are interesting. They should just really be more common. Let's. But, but Javier, yeah. I mean, I think there's a really big thing in what you just said that is worth calling out, which is that we need to come to terms with the fact, as a as a as a world, that many of the accountability structures and metrics that we use to judge teachers and to judge students' success and achievement are directly undermining the kind of learning that we're that we're advocating for. The kind of slow, Correct. careful retrieval practice, return to the idea, reconstruct it later, reread it after another week, think more about it, engage with your friend in a discussion about how it relates to what you're learning in another class. Those kinds of things are not rewarded. In fact, they're directly punished in many of our school systems. And then we wonder why the learning is shallow and the kids, by the time they get to college, are not deeply motivated and don't know why they're there. Right. Agreed. And that leads to the inequity piece of uh, the equation, which we promised in the title of this uh, webinar. So let's get... Uh, Just to give uh, students a little more credit in one way, you know, uh, <laughs> testing is kind of a bad word, even though retrieval practice is huge when it tests let you know what you don't know and so on. And often in talking to general audiences, I've had to use the phrase retrieval practice instead of testing. But recently, a number of teachers have found that if there's very frequent low stakes or no stakes quizzes, uh, students groan and moan and maybe some of them drop out early, but then on final course evaluations, they actually come to realize that those tests let them know what they needed to study more, that the practice on answering those made them able to answer meaningful questions later. So uh, just, there is an interesting issue. What sort of experience can give students a perspective that they can maybe evaluate good instruction uh, more highly. Can, can we put um, the practitioners um, now on stage to see what they're doing to actually make sure that what we're discussing is happening in the real world for more students. I'd like to turn to, to Ross and, and then to Richard. Um, so, so Ross, as I said at the beginning, is privileged with the education he has. And I love that he's trying to increase the number of students that succeed in transformations across schools. Um, what he does is try to transform the traditional model to uh, what you know, we call an industry or an industrial era model, 
to a modern 21st century model. So before I ask you a question to help us understand and unpack this, I have this graph here. Uh, we don't become educators because of household income. Most educators are passionate about their students learning and education is more than income. But I think as parents, we always want the well-being of our kids and there's a basic level of income that's necessary for that. And there is a direct correlation between education and income. The problem here where inequity is not a bad word, I think it's not a, a woke movement as, as one person told me in an email that they would not attend this event because that word was present. What I mean, I think is very simple, very direct. Education is positively correlated. This is a public good. We want as a society more people to succeed because the whole country is better off. Uh, we don't succeed by having two thirds fail. That, that's you know, it's not a zero sum game. But the inequity in the system is such that by the time we graduate from high school, one of six has not managed to do so. By the time we enroll in college, especially at a community college, I wish my story was anomalous, but I, I am one of millions that drop out from community colleges every year. These are drop out factories because the bridge to learning is never available to me. And it's pretty obvious and predictable that I will fail when I get to community college because I had not been taught to learn, right? So at a community college, five of the six that enroll will fail to meet their goal. They will drop out. This is the DFW rate that never goes up across the country. So we have millions of dropouts. And then overall in the US, about half of those that wanna get an education actually get an education. So we end up with one in three getting a degree. The last point I'll make is that if you come from a top 1% household income, you are 77 times more likely to get into an elite Ivy League university than those that don't come from a top 1%. So um, these are the sources I think of inequity because these are not supposed to be luxury brands. These are supposed to be public goods that people can access and technology makes that possible. So Ross, can you, sorry for my 10 minute question here. Can you unpack what you mean by the uh, industrial era education and also unpack what you mean by a 21st century education? Yeah, I'm happy to. I can, and I'll put in the chat the, um, a, do, a document that we use, just a one page document that helps summarize it. It's really building on what we've been hearing from the other panelists so far. Our K 12 system right now is, is in many cases structurally set up to support understandings of, of learning and development that are uh, a century old. And it's been very hard to update how our structures of teaching and learning are set up because innovation is very difficult to do in, in schools, especially um, without some support. And so Transcend, the organization, the nonprofit that I work for, um, works with schools to help actually address some of those structural, um, the, the structural aspects of their school design that are limiting equitable teaching and learning to happen. Um, I'm happy to, to speak more about it with folks that are interested. But, but just one last point that I would make to this, to this cooking metaphor is, um, I think you. it was David that said that, that um, teachers are actually cooks. They have to take all these critical ingredients of the science and learning and turn it into something that's palatable and nutritious. And I would argue that teachers are set up to fail if you're expecting them to be world-class cooks. They actually need some help in order to do that translation. Um, and we've seen a tremendous amount of success when we're able to have teachers at the table alongside additional capacity that has time and um, and connection to some of these principles working together to transform a school. So, Great point, completely agree with you. Um, it, is the model that we have in place, in your opinion, Ross, or in anyone else's, the culprit of this extreme inequity that's built of too many people wanting to succeed and failing to earn a degree, or is there something else that prevents the majority, two out of three, from getting the desired degree? The, the model was not designed with equity as a goal. And if, if, if there is going to be a new structure that is designed with equity as a goal, it will need to look different than most schools look today. So uh, an unfairly difficult question, but I'm sure you can handle it. What prevents um, innovation from flourishing in the school system when the evidence is overwhelming that we're sitting on top of a broken model that, you know, and the, it, it, the evidence is everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so a lot of things, I think bridges between academia and practice are certainly one. The biggest teachers and school leaders are the most constrained people in terms of time and headspace that I've come across in this country and expecting them to do innovation alongside 
the really difficult work that they're already doing every day uh, is too much to ask and they need help. Good answer. So what would constitute a successful career? What did you achieve in, in closing or, or building this? Uh, you, you, you're very talented and you've chosen this path. What will you hope to achieve uh, with what you're saying? What do you think is feasible? Uh, so this, this uh, LEAPS document that I, if, if I've contributed to a, a movement over the next several decades in which most schools in this country are characterized by the right side of those leaps instead of the left, left side of those leaps, that would be pretty cool. I agree 100%. And that brings us to Richard. Uh, thank you for waiting patiently. I, I, I have worked with all kinds of schools uh, through COGX and um, I have said to, to Richard that in meeting him and his team, I have found probably, I started off saying the top 3% of uh, sophisticated schools that truly got what Ross was just describing and what we were unpacking before in terms of uh, a really enlightened team of people that understand the vision of what transforming education uh, represents. And as I've met Richard and the team and we continue to work together, I've changed my description of top 3% to squarely top 1%. And graded really is an awesome institution. And Richard's a great leader. And I asked him to come because I wanted to ask him publicly, why does a school that have so many people eager to enter and be accepted, take on this risky venture of trying to change the traditional model of teaching and learning? You're at the top, aren't you risking everything? Um, the conversation tonight has been music to my ears. Uh, everything that the panelists have shared has been what we've been talking about uh, for the last couple of years as a faculty. Um, we believe it's a moral imperative. If, if we know what we know about how the brain works and how learning can be optimized, and we choose not to impart that on our students, then, then that's a crime, if you will. It, we have the opportunity to make meaning relevant and purposeful, um, rich in experience, giving the locus of control over to individuals. And so if we know that we can do those things and the cognitive science principles and metacognitive strategies that are there and available, and we don't do that for children, um, then I, I couldn't, I couldn't work in the institution that didn't believe that, that it knew something it could do and just chose it didn't have to do it. We, we don't have to do this, you're right. We, our kids are successful, but I would argue that they're not ready for the kinds of learning that David and Steve want in their classes in college in, a, in the full sense of how they described it. So while we have many successful students, I'm not, convinced that they fully are evolved in how to think deeply, how that learning can endure, and, and certainly how they're gonna be able to transfer that learning to various points of their lived life with, with purpose and meaning. So, you know, we've been on a, a very ambitious journey. Uh, we've supported ourselves with, fortunately, with some resources. We have deeper learning coaches that are trained in working with partners like you, Javier, and others to translate the research into what we call Monday morning experiences for teachers. So they can make meaning and purpose of this in a way that's usable, malleable for different levels of learners. We're a pre-primary uh, to K-12 school and we're committed to rising the tides of all learners. So all students will become metacognitive practitioners. And Mary Helen, we are a Montessori school and we see the evidence of the ways in which those young people think about their learning differently. And yes, sometimes it does take longer for that to come out of them, um, but it is helping to build a culture within our students and certainly within our faculty in, in how to think differently about what are the priorities of what we should be doing at school. Historically, we drive content to children. So we are these content vehicles. Uh, and then along the way we might happen to pass along some skills. We're trying to flip the paradigm to say that our purpose and role is to teach children metacognitive strategies, the ways in which to learn that are gonna stick for a lifetime. Oh, and by the way, I'm gonna teach that through the lens of mathematics or humanities or arts. And that's a big paradigm shift for teachers who are new, new coming out of university to even people who have been obviously out of education for 30 years. 
and reshaping and reframing their learning uh, is something that we're, you know, aggressively undertaking across an entire system of school. You, you uh, to just continue jumping on the bandwagon of metaphors here, you, you called it a crime to not do what you're doing, which I think is very noble and, and, and appropriate. And, and you have the agility and the resources to do this, which can prove the concept to other schools to follow, especially the systems that are harder to change, the public school systems. I, I, would, I would say, it's, perhaps I wouldn't call it a crime, but I, I appreciate you saying that, but I call it educational malpractice. And sure. the practitioner that is delivering this malpractice means well. I actually don't mm -hmm. bash teachers. I think they become teachers for the right reasons. And Absolutely. if they stay, they're true soldiers because they're not set up to succeed. They, they are aware of the fact that they're constrained and that what they wish they could do is something they cannot do. So I think we have an army that, that we're killing the passion and the drive that brought them to uh, teach and and we're really breaking them and and you see that you see wonderful teachers leaving and wonderful teachers yep. staying but it is really it, it, it's at a price right it, and, and it that, is, there's a lot of consensus on so what it's would incredibly you... hard it's incredibly hard and we need an army of translators to help teachers understand this work that this is not easy to comprehend and nor to put into practice um, when I've been teaching a certain way for 20, 30 years, and I have to reframe and reshape how I'm processing this. That process of, of evolution at our school is taking months, if not years, with coaching, side by side guiding and supporting and building capacity. Uh, that's not easy to do across massive systems and public, wow. public school systems. Is it fair to ask what mistakes you've made along the way that you would... Um want others to learn from? And then what advice would you provide to schools that are inspired to follow your footsteps? Uh, yeah, so lessons learned, so many. We began in, in 2019 pre-pandemic with, with our, our kind of what we called our big pivot. And we made our move to focus on cognitive science principles. And so we started tackling varieties of topics. The high school spent a half a year diving into uh, working memory. Uh, the middle school on retrieval practice, the lower school on productive struggle. And we started to tackle and unpack what these meant and apply them in practice in the classroom. What we realized after a pause during the pandemic and a real reckoning in <laughs> how we approach learning through uh, the lens of a camera, that we needed to start in a different place. And so our pilot project that's launched now that just is actually completed yesterday with our first group of 20 educators is focused around the concepts of mastery, identity, and creativity. We must get right the sense of identity for a child, uh, their, their sense of belonging and purpose and relevance in a classroom. What is, how does a teacher ensure that belonging isn't that kids smile on the campus? They need to be academically belonging to the environment of one context, which might be different than another. So there are some real fundamental baseline types of things that we should be operating with in the beginning before we accelerate and build upon then further with, with cognitive science principles. So we see this very much as a foundation and then a secondary uh, uh, phase in our work. I just wanna intrude one thing quickly. The, this, the, the potential here goes both ways. Uh, I've had interactions with an algebra teacher in Mississippi, a law school, director in Florida and so on, that incorporate, I never, if you would put me in charge, I never would have appreciated what needed to be done and how it should be introduced the way they did. And, and really, if you wanna, it's like, it's not just a matter of uh, basic researchers, maybe at the college level, um, talking about these principles and results. It's equally important to know enough about the classroom to know how those should be implemented. I mean, that that's, I never would have been as effective in a number of the situations that people have emailed me about just because I was not aware of the realities of classrooms at that level, realities of interactions with parents and whatever. It, so the, the, the potential for, uh, I mean, Richard is, and, and a couple other people I think of are acting as an incredibly important bridge here, but it, um, it's just yep. very important to have the communication go both ways.
Yeah, Javier, can, can I jump in really quick too? Please, yes. Um, thanks, Bob, for giving me the permission to do it, the guts to do it. <laughs> um, Ross and Richard, um, I, I'm really digging what you're saying. I, I've spent my entire last 20 years of my career trying to argue that translation is a separate and important skill set. Um, it's, it's too much to put that all on the teacher or all on the the uh, researcher for that matter, because it involves a different skill set. And Ross has developed a model where people are pairing up and being supported to do some of that. Richard's developed a way that's working for you. Um, that, you know, I, I have models I've developed. I spend most of my time working with K-12 teachers and, and, and um, uh, districts uh, trying to, to argue for this idea of the translation is important. And then adaptation is what the teacher does from the primary translation, right? Um, so I think we should start thinking about um, what's the infrastructure for sharing these models? What's the infrastructure for sharing these successes that you're having so that other people can replicate and extend? Also, what, what's not working? A teacher needs to know what doesn't work just as much as they need to know what does work. Correct. And we have a bias toward just the things that are significant. Well, some things in significance really important. So I've just wanted to really support what you're doing and, and call out that you're, you're developing translational models um that the, 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 the entire field needs and I, I really find that important matter of fact I, I think if this lived in schools rather than the university it would be awesome yeah thank you for that very important point we're accidentally on time to allow about 20 minutes for q a uh, i think just to summarize here the last point you made is that farm to table might be a good model for restaurants but it's not a good model for uh education in the sense that we don't go from the lab to the classroom. There has to be an intermediary step where translation is really important. Um, uh, when we launched COGX 11 years ago to help bring to schools research and translate this, uh, we didn't know how uh, lacking this was and how important this was. I honestly uh, wanted to prevent the failure of other students, um, as, as I think is it Karl Marx that says, one death is a tragedy, but millions of deaths is just statistics. That's what we have in the school system. We have millions of dropouts and failures. I didn't do this for the therapy because I am different. I'm actually doing it because there are millions like me that fail and that doesn't need to be the case. So I wanna thank you guys uh, for joining. It's not over, the Q&A starts now. I'm just uh, eagerly uh, thanking you for staying a little bit longer. So why don't we open this up for Q&A? We have a little less than 20 minutes to take some questions and. We'll try to be brief in the answer so we can get through as many as possible. And um, the Q&A here. Uh, so for Richard, what is the impact of grading on making it difficult to do what you are doing? Um, ironically, that's the name of your school. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is ironic. Um, before we began the work in the science of learning and, and those efforts, uh, we already went through a, a ref reformation process of our assessment practices. And so uh, we are a school that, that allows students to show multiple um, or provide multiple opportunities to show evidence of learning. Um, that learning happens when, when learning is ready. Uh, while that is not perfectly applied, I'll be, I will admit um, the idea that students, you know, not everybody learned how to read in the same moment in life. And nor should everybody be ready at the same exact moment for that same exam experience. So we allow students to reassess. We customize that reassessment for a student based on their needs. So what do you need is different from what I need and what I wanna make sure I show evidence of. I wanna know, we want proof that a student is ready to move forward and, and progress. So uh, students um, hopefully are performing for the learning rather than for the, the result. Um, the numeric value of whatever that is. We don't average grades. We don't give zeros for anything. Um, and we allow teachers to use their professional judgment to determine a student's progress and their final outcome. Wonderful. So we had about 20 questions that appear to actually have been answered throughout uh, the process, which uh, is great. I, I, I knew at the beginning that this, this would be a, a fabulous uh, interaction with you guys. I wasn't sure I could pull off the caliber of panelists that, uh, that, that we got. And uh, I'm, I'm grateful that we had 20 questions answered as we went along, but we have another one for Richard coming here that says, I'm wondering if you can continue to describe or unpack your school's journey. Sure. Um, boy, it's a big open question. There's a lot, lot yeah. to a journey of a school, right? 
Um, specifically in this work, um, we began to, to, I think, ask ourselves really tough questions about ourselves. Were we satisfied with the results of what our students could do with what they had learned? Um, you know, learning in the moment, great. Um, test, great. Results, great. College admissions, great. Um, but did we think that those students were having transformational experiences post-graded and inside of graded? Were we asking them the kinds of difficult questions? One of our core values is intellectual curiosity. What ways in which are we asking students to be curious about their learning? Uh, have we had students every day say to us, why, so what? What's the point of me learning this? We want students to question us and challenge us um, to, to answer that in real applicable ways. And then if we can't answer that, then we have to look inside and look back at ourselves and say, okay, well, what's the purpose of what we're providing them? Now, we're, we're, we have some freedom as an independent international school. Uh, we're not tied by some of the same um, uh, constraints that public schools in the United States are. Um, but hopefully, in, in ways that we can replicate and share this out, we can, we can share and show a model. We've opened, uh, briefly, and then I'll, I'll close, we've opened a, a, an institute called the Learning Lab, uh, and it's a place for us to iterate and prototype our, our design practices, and uh, just opened as the pandemic um, came, so it, it will be in a position uh, in the fall where we'll be opening up to schools around the world to come and learn with us and learn side by side. Great. A question here for Dr. Bjork. Your Desirable Difficulties framework has really enriched my teaching. The main area of criticism that I've seen come across from a cognitive load theory perspective, where a difficulty that overwhelms a student's working memory capacity will lead to less learning. How do you suggest that teachers use these two seemingly competing theories to improve learning outcomes? There's a long answer to that one. I, I'll kind of <laughs> sidestep it a little bit, but we sometimes have to, when I say we, the Elizabeth Bjork and I sometimes have to emphasize that the word desirable is important and contains a lot of things in it. So if you, if you, there's a level of difficulty, for example, we talked about the power of retrieval practice and generation. There are no benefits if it can't happen. So one of the skills teachers have in dealing with individual students is to ask questions, give assignments that given a, a, a given students preparation, it's possible to generate and so on. So it's, it's, um, it's not just make things hard and that's good for people. And really um, some of maximizing teacher, a whole lot of it's gonna depend on um, skills as a teacher that are, that are really important and so on and how they deal with individual students and what sort of assignments and so on. I mean, something like retrieval practice, variation, all the things we've talked about, they're very general principles, but they don't have benefits uh, if they sort of can't happen. And, but again, I really wish there was some kind of national funding program that would let laboratory university researchers like me and other people on Richard and others on this, that they were, there were funding programs that would put people in the schools and basic researchers together. I mean, we spent a massive amount of money on, you know, things like uh, neuroscience, brain imaging, and so on, and very costly kind of research. And just having, um, putting together people in the realities of the classroom with researchers. Absolutely. Be very if, if I could jump in to have your on, on, on that question for Robert, you know, that that is that whole notion of the zone of proximal development that you don't want to over challenge your students. If you over challenge them, you demotivate them. But then how do you know? And so I, I would like to give the sort of other bookend where first I said, you know, explain to your students why you're asking them to do what that you're asking them to do and then what's in it for them. So make sure you do that part at the front at the back end. Be a reflective educator. Ask questions. How did this work for you? You know, was it overwhelming or was it not? And, and in a more general sense, through practices like that, if you can show that you're there and that you care, what we call instructor presence or teacher presence, uh, you know, I saw a lot of questions about what do we do when students aren't motivated or aren't into it or how do we, you know, bring them into the learning environment? 
if they think you really care about their success and that you're trying really hard to optimize it and you're doing intelligent things in the first place and then asking how it went with the possibility that it didn't go as well as you think. And so you're modeling a sort of growth mindset at the same time. That power you have as an instructor is, is really powerful and, and they will resonate with that and they will want to do well in your classroom. Um, so I just wanted to throw that in as, a, as an additional Absolutely. answer. Absolutely. So Thank you all. The, the, a lot of the people present here as panelists have inspired the work that we've been doing for years in translating the science and making it accessible, democratizing access to what we think every student needs to know to succeed and become an independent lifelong learner and to equipping educators to be more sophisticated, to borrow from Robert Bjork's terminology. And um, our, you know, if I could answer the question I asked Ross, my, my goal would be the same as yours. <laughs> I'd like to see a world where there are more enlightened schools like Richard's where they're pursuing learning because it's worth knowing how to learn and that requires teaching effectively and with that I just want to conclude on time and thank everyone for for joining us today hopefully this is not our last conversation this this was great for me and I hope the audience uh, enjoyed it as much as I did thank you guys thanks for preparing everything so well Javier structuring it so well <laughs> Thanks, y'all. Thank you. It's easy with you guys. Thank you. Panelists, thank you so much. It's an honor. Great to it's pretty stage pretty hard to keep nice people time. like us on time. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. So I'll just thank you all so much. Um, again, uh, I'm Courtney Lightfoot, uh, uh, Managing Director of Alumni Engagement at ELSOM. I just want to thank you all so much. What an incredibly engaging and dynamic discussion. I want to give a very, very special thanks to our guest panelists. Uh, thank you for sharing with us your time, your very precious time, your insight and your expertise with our audience. Professor Mary Helen Imordino Yang of University of Southern California and, and Director of the USC Center of Neuroscience Development and Learning and Education. Professor Robert Bjork of USCLA. Richard Borner, Superintendent at Graded, the American School of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Ross Lescano Lipstein, partner of Learning Engineering at Transcend and also a proud Broad Center alumnus. Uh, Professor Steve Jordans of the University of Toronto, Professor David Daniel of James Madison University. We are so incredibly grateful to all of you. Thank you. I wanna thank all, all of our participants. Our, uh, we have Yale alumni, Broad Center alumni, uh, many educators and other special guests joining us. Um, and I need to give a very special thanks to Javier Arguello for making this discussion possible. Uh, a recording will be sent to registrants within a day or two. Um, we will also try to see about sending you all of the chat and Q&A transcripts because there was just so much going on. Um, and so, uh, I'm sure you would all love to see that, and we're going to we'll see what we can do to make that uh, possible. So thank you all again. We look forward to seeing you at future events, and stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.